So I know it's a Friday, and it's also Valentine's Day, and it's also about 15 degrees outside. So I want to give everyone a special warm welcome here, and you know we're very appreciative that you chose to be here with us today. Um, so today we'll hear from two young trailblazing entrepreneurs who both schooled in the U.S. and then decided to leave and go back to Africa to pursue an entrepreneurial journey. Um, but before we introduce them, I do want to introduce the moderator, who is Luchi. Luchi is actually uh, a very dear classmate of mine and also a good friend. I met Lucci at our Accepted Students Day about two years ago, and just after one conversation, I immediately included him in that list of people who I think are some of the most brilliant people I've ever met. Uh, we, you know, I, I thought he would be a great moderator for this event because, one, he's almost like an encyclopedia for everything that has to do with African business and politics, but two, he's the only person I know that could you know, read two books in two days and actually digest it. So Lucci, welcome and thank you. So now we're actually going to introduce um, Yomi and Sangu with introductory videos. Um, so I, the first one will be of Sangu. Sangu Dele is a Ghanaian entrepreneur, author, and activist. He is a co-founder and CEO of Africa Health Holdings, an innovative company based in West Africa focused on building Africa's healthcare future. He also serves as the chairman of Golden Palm Investments Corporation, a holding company invested in world-class technology companies across Africa. Golden Palm Investments has backed technology startups such as Andela, M Pharma, and Flutterwave, and its portfolio companies have raised over $900 million in venture financing. Sangu is also the co-founder of Clean Aqua, a non-profit working in underdeveloped communities in Ghana to make sure water sanitation and basic human rights are provided. Sangu has received several international accolades, including being named Africa's Young Person of the Year, one of Forbes' top 30 most promising entrepreneurs in Africa, a TED Fellow, and Euromoney's Africa Rising Stars Award for outstanding individuals who are changing the financial, investment, and business landscape in Africa. My name is Sangu Julius Delhi. I graduated from Harvard College in 2010, Harvard Law School, and Harvard Business School in 2017. I am an entrepreneur and an Afro-futurist. Welcome, Sangu. Now, before we introduce um, Yomi, I do want to tell a, a brief story. So on Wednesday, all of the flights that were incoming and, and outgoing from Lagos, Nigeria, were all canceled um, due to weather, due to Hamatan, essentially. Um, most of those flights were also canceled on Thursday. So I got the call from, um, from Yomi that he might not be able to make it, and then we immediately turned into travel agents. We spent the night looking for different flights, different routes here and there, and luckily at the last minute, he was able to catch a flight, God willing, and he actually landed in Boston about two hours ago. So with that, um, let me introduce Yomi Jembewan. Yomi Jembewan is Managing Director and Co-Founder of Cardinal Stone Capital Advisors, a Nigerian private equity fund manager that is managing what today is a $70 million fund targeted at making growth investments into SMEs in Nigeria and Ghana. The fund's investors include Kuramo Capital, the UK government CDC, the Dutch government's FMO, the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority, the IFC, and the European Investment Bank. Yomi spent his childhood years growing up in Nigeria. After high school, he moved to the US, where he attended Virginia Tech for his bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering. On graduating, Yomi joined Motorola, where he worked as a research engineer for three years before returning to school for his MBA at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. After his MBA, Yomi joined Bain & Company, where he spent two years first working in the private equity group, then on general practice consulting engagements across several industries. In 2007, after hitting a wall of discontent with his life in corporate America, Yomi decided to move back to Nigeria with the hope of rediscovering his passion for life, but with big fears of the unknown. A year later, he joined three other partners on a new venture to incubate Cardinal Stone. After an extremely tumultuous start that coincided with the 2008 financial crisis and two successive economic downturns, the Cardinal Stone Group has today grown to become a respected brand name in Nigeria with interests across multiple sectors of the economy. In 2018, Yomi released his first book, risk and return. This book chronicles the story of his return home and the life lessons learned 
while on his entrepreneurial journey. Yomi shares his story with the hope of inspiring and encouraging other Africans at home and abroad to overcome their fears and natural inhibitions towards becoming more active in catalyzing positive change across Africa. So I'd, I'd first like to thank you both for being with us here today and for writing these two books. I think having read both books, I can confidently say that they lay out a narrative uh, of lessons that are very helpful for entrepreneurs like ourselves and for you know, people who just care about the future of the continent. So the plan for today will be really to have a conversation here between the two of us, the three of us, for the first 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. We're going to have a wide-ranging discussion talking about the repatriation repatriation process, the entrepreneurial journey, and uh, thinking about you know, your thoughts about the future of this generation of African entrepreneurs. So I think it would make sense to just start off with the repatriation process. You know, why did you guys want to move back? You know, obviously, you'd spent some time here. You had opportunities to stay here. What drove that decision for each of you? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Luchi. Um, for me, it was a search for happiness. Um, that might sound corny, but I think um, what happened was I hit a wall um, around, I was about 18 months into my time at Bain. And I think 18 months before that, and I think the, the two years before that were like the best times of my life. Wharton Business School, I got my uh, dream job with Bain. Um, I, my, my fiance at the time was living in New York. I was living in New York. Um, I was supposed to be happy, but I was miserable. And um, I was miserable for a number of reasons. Um, I didn't like my job. Uh, I, um, I didn't think I was that good at it. I was getting feedback um, that when I was trying to implement the feedback, I felt I was getting further and further away from my core, the way I spoke, you know, you know smiling when I don't want to be, when I don't think something is funny. And um, <laughs> just, I couldn't really express myself. So, um, and then I saw the, my managers and partners and how I felt they were, and I'm like, is that what I'm aspiring for? And for the first time, I said to myself, um, I, I need to figure out, you know, um, this path I'm on, is it the right path for me? And I've always been a very proud Nigerian. I had been in America for about 13 years at that time, and uh, you know, but I'd never lived in Nigeria as an adult, and I was saying, maybe, this, maybe that's where I could be myself. Maybe, that's, maybe I should go explore. Um, but I didn't know how to explore. I had a lot of questions. Um, but for me, that was what drove my repatriation, a search um, to find myself. And I was like, look, even if it doesn't work out, what's the worst that could happen? I could just come back. So that was it. Um, I think for me, I never really saw it as repatriation, because in my mind, I never left. Uh, I, it was very clear to me mentally when I left Ghana that I'm moving, I'm, I'm gaining experiences, I'm gaining educational qualifications, and so on and so forth. But it was never in my mind that I had left, I had ever left. And so the other thing I also ensured was I made sure that every year I kept going back. Right? I had started um, Golden Palm Investments 14 years ago. Right? And so I was actively, I was physically making sure I was on the continent every year. I had business interests and entrepreneurial ventures on the continent. But more importantly, I was emotionally and philosophically rooted in the continent. And so there was no question or debate for me as to, am I going to move back? It was just a matter of, when do I move back? That makes sense. And uh, I guess, I mean, a question for you, you know, as you thought about making that move, given that your situation was a little bit different, what were the steps that you took, what were the conversations that you had what were you listening for to reinforce or scare you away from what you thought? Yeah, I, I, I took a lot of stuff. First, first of all, I, I decided I needed to do something. I think at the time, my, my fiance, who uh, is, is now my wife, and she's American, she was like, why don't you quit and get a new job? And I'm like, and, and get back into the same thing. Like, so it was clear that I wanted to go home. I didn't know how to. So first thing was, okay, this lady that I've been dating that I, I think I want to marry, if I go back home, how's that gonna work? So I started engaging her. So that's the first thing. So home, Start, starting at home. And she was like, man, look, anything that's gonna get you back to the Yomi I met, I'll support. So, okay, that was good. 
<laughs> two, I had friends um, who had gone back. Um, Dan Laddie's a good friend, Verod. Um, he, we were in business school at the same time, and he was one of those after school, he went right back. So he was one I just reached out to, and I was like, hey, you know, this journey to go back, uh, how do I do it? I think now you have all these uh, American companies that are back, uh, back in Africa. Then the consulting firms, because I was working at Bain, they were not in Nigeria. McKinsey was the only one doing projects in Nigeria, for, but from South Africa. So, and consulting was still not respected. I hope, I think they respect consultants better now, but then they were still not respected. So just figuring out how do I transition back? Uh, so talking to him and then family back home as well. Um, but it wasn't to decide, I had made my mind that, up that I was going back. It was more of how do I navigate this in a way um, that made sense for me. Um, so um, home, um, so the person I was dating, friends that had repatriated to understand, you know, how do I think about this practically, uh, family as well. Um, I, mean, I, I talked to friends here, but th they were, you know, they were the guys that asking most of the questions. Ah, did you just read the news? <laughs> so I just, you know. I was clear, I was going. That makes sense. I think, you know, sometimes, you know, when I'm speaking with people who are thinking of going back, one of the things that's always interesting to me is this fixation on soft landings. People are trying to find that six-figure job that will pay them to live in Lagos and give them a driver, a car, a house, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, from your perspective, having been through this entrepreneurial journey for this many years, how do you think about soft landings? Is it advisable? Is it possible? Is it unadvisable? How, how do you think about that concept? I think, Look, I, I, I think you need to, I don't think there's a, you know, cookie can't, you know, cookie cutter response to this, right? I think it really depends on the individual. But what I'll say is you need to understand it's, the problem I find most people have is a divergence between their expectations and reality, right? And so it's very important to ensure that you actually understand what the underground reality is and understand what matters to you, what you can deal with, what you can't deal with, right? And so it's, I find that a lot of times people come back and they become very frustrated because they have this maybe romanticized idea of what it is like to be back home. And a lot of the problem is where that romanticized idea meets the hard reality of what on the ground looks like, right? And so are you prepared for, you know, NEPA, power cuts, doom saw, right? No, it's like, are you actually prepared for that to know that if you're gonna go back, all right, I need to make sure that my setup, you know, that's taken care of. The other thing I think that's also very important is you, you need to make sure that I think it's important to make sure financially you can figure your stuff out, right? So you, you need to make sure that you have enough of a war chest to give yourself time to figure it out. Because if you are in the soup trying to figure stuff out, and that's the soup that's supposed to feed you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? It's like you are drowning and the soup is burning you at the same time, right? So you need to be in, especially when you've just moved back, there's, there's so many interesting things that, look, I don't care whether, you know, I, I, with my Harvard degrees, your Watson degree is, is, it helps to a certain degree, but there's some underground realities where it's meaningless. You, you have certain forms of capital, certain forms of social capital that makes sense here, where you meet your other person. Oh, I went to Harvard, oh, I went to Oxford, but on the ground, do you have the proper social networks that matter? Do you, do you have the networks, do you know the right sorts of people who can really help you to get things done? Do, are you tapped into the old boy network, the old girl networks that actually really truly have the repositories of knowledge that are crucial? And so I think there's a way in which you also need some humility to go on the ground and realize that there's some knowledge you have that's valuable, but there's a lot of local knowledge and a lot of local social networks and social capital that's very relevant to you having success on the ground. You need to have that humility to make sure that you amass that knowledge and you accrue those necessary social capitals and social networks that will allow you to succeed. That makes sense. And you know, jumping off on that question, and you know, a question to you, you know, reading the book, I was surprised by how detailed your business plans were as you were coming in, right? To the level of detail, thinking year after year, what's going on five, 10 years from now. You know, based on what Sangu is talking about here, you know, how much of the opportunity set in your markets did you feel like you could see from abroad? And how much did you have to come and relearn when you got there? <laughs> and how did you deal with the dislocation between those two things if there was a dislocation? First of all, I could not see anything from abroad. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, 
what helped me, you know, that I'll just, just tell a story related to that that's in the book. Um, I, I'm the one that left early, I had all these degrees. I mean, Femi too came to business school, went to Goldman, but I mean, I was trying to raise half a million dollars in that. I had moved back, I was trying to raise half a million dollars and find one partner. And I got a call from Femi and he said, Yomi, um, two other guys that I knew from Nigeria uh, and I, we want to start a, an investment banking firm and we're thinking you could join us. I'm like, okay, how much are you guys trying to raise? $24 million. <laughs> I'm like, what? They came on ground and in two weeks, we had commitments for $24 million. Not from, not from politicians, not from, from business people credible. Like these are guys that they went to Unilag, Uniben, worked at PwC, but they worked in firms um, with people that, with, you know, they were on mandates that they had impressed people that they could call to say we're coming back. You know, that they had done, you know, transactions with people that respected them. I didn't have any of this. I, and I was the most privileged of the four of us because I came from, you know, my dad was in the military and all that, but I didn't know any of that. So that goes back to what he's saying, um, that you need to have, now, if you don't have it, it doesn't mean you need to go cultivate it to think you can start. You can partner with people or you can, you know, align with people, right? Collaborations also make sense, which is what I did. But uh, over, um, just in line with what you said, the business plan, uh, all that stuff, you know, one consultant and three, you know, uh, three investment bankers, we thought we, we could get it to the detail and we did get it to the detail. It got us the money, but everything six months later, we had to throw it all out. I mean, yeah. <laughs> And I guess, you know, you know, when you think about partner with people, align with people, I guess on the, one of the things in the both books that was interesting is that that's happening on one level, which is your business partner, and another level that's advisory boards and board of directors, that kind of alignment as well. So how do you approach that question of who do I put on my board? How do I balance big names versus functional skills? What's that process like for you, Sangha? Um So I think there are a couple of things that are important. So the first is, I know a lot of times our initial instinct is to go for, you know, the biggest name you can get to say X, Y, Z is on my board, right? And I always advise that you're better off putting that big name person on maybe on your advisory board if you want to just have the signaling effect of that to say so-and-so endorses your business. But if you want your board to actually work properly, if you want it to be a real source of advice for you, if you want it to exercise its fiduciary responsibility to ensure that corporate governance is on point, you need to have people who are actually going to invest the time. That may or may not be some of those big name people, right? It, it really depends on, but I think you need to be upfront and one good advice I got from a mentor was, you need to be very clear about your expectations so in all my conversations with board members, it wasn't fluffy. It was very, this is kind of what I need. This is what I'm looking for from, you know, hours that you expect the person to, to be available. But the other thing that's also important is you need to do a, a SWOT analysis of yourself in the business and understand what are, your, what are your weaknesses? Where do you need strengths, right? Where do you need to find board members that can make up for some of those deficiencies? And then the other thing that's also important is you need to make sure you have a diverse board, right? And, and the scholarship, I think, is quite clear that, you know, the, the more diverse boards, um, I think if you look at most of the data over the last half century or so, they generally tend to outperform. Because you don't want to have groupthink. You don't want to just have your friends and people who think like you on the board. You want to make sure that you have people who are going to challenge you, people who are going to bring um, different perspectives and are going to say, well, have you thought about things this way? You know, I've, I saw this in this context or this other different industry, and, and they bring those things to bear. Those, those things are very, very important. And um, for, at least for our business in Nigeria, I, I realize this in Nigeria more so than any other um, African market I've operated in. You really need to have someone who understands the ground game in Nigeria on your board, because it's a different market. <laughs> And if you don't, then they'll ban Okada on you. <laughs> uh, is there anything you'd add? No, I mean, the only thing I have to add is um, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs that are in a hurry to be their own masters, to be their own um, bosses. I always say, look for people to be accountable to. Mm -hmm. Look for 
people to be accountable to. Uh, and I think that's what I have to add because there will be those difficult times, where, there'll be th those times when you have difficult decisions to make. And sometimes having people that you're accountable to keeps you in line. Just, yeah. And you know, as we think, okay, you know, if we're going down the journey, now we have our partners, now we have our board, now we're thinking about the team and growing a team. One of the common threads you know, in both books was really struggles as regards to securing talent, retaining them, training them, securing them. You know, can you guys speak to that process? I mean, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, man, it's an ongoing process. <laughs> it uh, never ends. I mean, I had two conversations last week about this. Um, look, how did we, we started by having to, um, we were being interviewed by parents when we were trying to hire because, I mean, there were the KPMGs, PWCs, the banks, and my daughter just came back from NYU. Why, why should she work with Cardinal Stone? So we were being interviewed by parents uh, because at that time when the market crashed, we had to get, it was four partners, we hired analysts. With time, as the analysts grew, we started bringing in mid-management, a number of challenges. The market started respecting, hearing about our brand and respecting our brand, and then we became the arsenal of, if you're into Premier League, people started poaching our um, analysts, but more importantly, our experienced hires um, had a, there was a fit issue. Um, many of them, in a way, roll up your sleeve organization, um, with, you know, first name, you know, like American style, and they would come in with a chip on their shoulder. They wanted to be Oga um, boss. And, you know, there was a conflict issue. And so with time, we realized, okay, we, we need to groom uh, our, our young ones, period. So we're right now in the fourth year of a graduate trainee, our graduate trainee program. Mm -hmm. um, every year, um, we have 5,000 applicants. We test 200. We do an assessment center for 20, and we hire 8 to 15. And we know that, uh, we know that, um, uh, after, and they sign a contract. But their first four months, they're in class, right? Just no work, right? And they do a rotation. And then we know that, and, and then they sign a, a contract for two years, um, and then uh, we hope to retain, at least at that point, at least 80% of them, but we expect that after four years, 50% will go, but that's fine because we're actually now getting the rewards because they're getting embedded into strong organizations in Nigeria. Some of them are becoming partners in business. Um, and we're grooming, and they're now becoming senior, like the, the, the first class, they're now second year associates. Um, and we selectively poached. Last year, we, we poached four people from KPMG. So we're growing. Like, it's a journey. Um, and then the culture. We have annual culture surveys, um, you know, and, you know and, and we work on that. And we've gotten to a point where the partners have stepped back and we let the culture develop from within. So when you come to Cardinal Stone, there's an energy. There's a, there's a, the, we built that. And so every organization has to do invest, you know, some kind of investment in that because... Um, the market just doesn't, culture is, we have smart people, but when they get trained with a certain kind of expectation, when you bring them in at senior levels, there can be a culture clash. I don't know, your experience. Yeah, no, I, look, I think it's the most challenging um, part of doing business, to be very honest. I mean, I, I had a conversation with an investor at one point where um, he said, you know, what if I give you a billion dollars to deploy in, 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 in your strategy? And I said, the billion dollars, I can deploy it from a standpoint of an opportunity set. But the, the bottleneck is really going to be human capital. And so the training part is so key. You know, a lot of times there was this joke I saw, this meme I saw where it was a debate between the CEO and the CFO. And the CFO said, boss, we're spending so much money training all these people. We train them, we train them, we're investing money in training them, and then they are leaving to go into other companies. The CEO said, and imagine if we didn't train them and they stayed. <laughs> <laughs> right? so, so, I mean, for me, I think at the end of the day, given the challenges that we have, you have to invest in training. But I also try to think about it from a systems, you know, almost like a, a broader macro perspective. So I'm personally very invested on the philanthropy side, on board side, in, in the education sector. Because I think if we think about this from a scale perspective, if we do not fix this skills gap, if we do not fix this issue of how do we get the right sort of education, critical 
thinking, right? The, the right sorts of learning skills. Because there's a mismatch between what I see in terms of the output from a lot of universities versus what industry needs, right? And, and at scale, this is a huge problem. I mean, we have about 11 million young Africans enter the labor force every single year to meet 3 million jobs. And this is with us at 1.2, 1.3 billion people. And you forecast the demographic trends, we're going to be 2.5 billion, right? And, and so when you crunch the numbers on that, there is a time bomb, there's an urgency, right? And, and so that's why I'm excited about you know, what Fred Swanica is doing with ALU, I'm excited with what Patrick Iria is doing with Ashesi, but it's still not enough, we need more. And so therein also lies an opportunity. Look, for some of the people here who are thinking about moving back, you all should be thinking about moving back. Um, one of the great opportunities is how you can solve this problem, this skills gap, this education issue. Because I know Yomi and I will both pay premium <laughs> if you can solve this issue, right? We, I mean, lots of companies will pay to be able to make sure that we don't have to end up having to you know, invest so much time and energy doing this. And so that, this is a real opportunity for, for aspiring entrepreneurs. And I think you know, it's interesting that you, you, know, you speak of how difficult it is to find talent and how underprepared you know, our job market seems to be to absorb everybody. Yet, you know, as we read both books, you know, particularly yours, you, know, you lay out an interesting case of challenges being faced by female entrepreneurs specifically. Right? People who are talented, you know, they have the skills, they have the idea, they have everything, yet society or the business community or the capital sources don't seem to want to play the same way they do with male entrepreneurs. Can you talk about that yeah. situation and the impediments? Look, it, it's, to me, it, it's, it's something that is of great importance and is, is actually a tragedy. We have a huge asset on the continent. We have the highest rate of female entrepreneurship. We have more female entrepreneurs on a rate basis starting businesses in Africa than anywhere else in the world. I mean, in Nigeria, and Ghana, and Zambia, we have a higher rate of female entrepreneurship than male entrepreneurship. Yet, when you dig into it, you realize that there is a, the inequalities that a lot of entrepreneurs face, they are heavily gendered. Access to financing. I don't know if many of you saw that report that came out, startups that raise more than $1 million. You think you're looking at you know, the Boy Scouts. There, there, there are almost no women on that list. And it is inconceivable. It makes no sense. So let, let's dig into it further. You dig into it further and you realize that where is the capital actually coming from, right? The, the, who, who are the decision makers, the, the allocators of that capital? And when you enter that room of the decision makers, it's mostly men, right? And then so the, there was one entrepreneur I met who um, had, she had started a startup on uh, a tech app basically looking at women, black women's hair. Women's hair is a massive industry. It's, it's like, a, it's globally, it's a hundred billion dollar industry. And anyone who knows any black woman knows that, that it's a massive industry. Yet, when this entrepreneur had a meeting in Silicon Valley with a partner at a firm I wouldn't name, but a firm that we all respect, this man just looked at her and said, hey, what? We are talking about something now, make money. You are saying hey because he could not relate to it. But I want you to think about that story and scale it up. How many conversations are aspiring female entrepreneurs having with venture capitalists and potential investors who cannot relate or understand? And so that's why it is critically important for us to have diversity across these places. And so when you have this sort of gendered inequality in those spaces among the decision makers, it trickles down to all of this. Yet the research also shows that every incremental dollar in the hand of a woman, 90 cents gets reinvested in the, fam in the family's health, education, and nutrition. And those of us, when we growing up, we know our mothers. Men, just 30 cents. <laughs> and the difference is why BS stocks do so well. <laughs> no, but seriously, it, it, it's not only it's not just a moral issue, right? But it, it's a clear socioeconomic issue. And, and so it, 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 
you know, the, the McKinsey had this report that said, if we actually achieved gender equality, we could expand global GDP by $12 trillion. And so we're running around always having these conversations about infrastructure and um, all the different things that we need to do and, and, and all that stuff is important and critical, but that there's a low hanging fruit. Just, you know, gender equality, which actually doesn't require any financial investment. It simply just means that we remove the, the nonsensical obstacles that prevent our women from having the same access to opportunities as our men. If you don't, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna add two Please. things. Um, the, the, the first is, from my experience, even in Cardinal Stone, what I just talked about our people, we've actually noticed um, we've had more stability mm -hmm. and more confidence in our women managers in the organization as we've grown. As we actually look to invest in businesses, because in some of our businesses we've noticed that as well, we're actually eagerly like, looking for uh, women-led businesses um, to invest in. But I want to share one of the challenges that women face as entrepreneurs as well. Um, business can be very, um, can be very um, non-informal and casual. Uh, getting business to happen globally, but in, in Africa in particular, a lot of night meetings, a lot of after work meetings. And I mean, when I moved back to Nigeria like 12 years ago, I had female friends who did not feel comfortable getting apartments by themselves because people would think they were, you know, they were doing funny things. Although they worked, they had good jobs, they were well educated, and they were restricting themselves because of what communities say, will say about them. So if you, if you think about how many night meetings we entrepreneurs have to go for. Um, so the woman entrepreneur is going for the same night meetings, what are her family members saying to her? So it's an ecosystem issue yeah. as well. And that also affects things significantly. And so that's why um, a lot of the push that um, even the funders are doing to make sure that there are more fund managers that have women, it helps so that some of these things can change from all, and it, it needs to be an ecosystem effort, but said enough on that. You know, I think you know, both of your, your answers here, you know, you talked a little bit about capital and the role capital plays in changing some of these trends and really building some of these businesses. And I think one of the things that was fascinating in, in both books, again, is the role it seems to be that African government funding has in some entrepreneurial stories, you know, thinking as LPs and funds or intervention funds that are supporting small businesses. Uh, I guess, Yomi, we could start with you. Could you talk through how you approach that source of funding? How do you navigate that given okay. the whole? So we're always very, we're very careful. Um, <laughs> we, we, we try to insulate ourselves from government. You know, you need to decide what your um, competitive advantage is and what you stand for. You cannot do anything uh, without coming in touch with government. You now need to decide in what way you want to come in touch with government. There's some people that, you know, they do government contracts. There are some people that, every business has a regulator, and that regulator has government. We were very clear. We did not want government funding. We did not want um, PEP funding, so publicly um, exposed uh, uh, personnel. Um, we, so that's on that front. Even as a financial institution, because we're quite highly regulated, um, there, are many, there are many of our peers that their strength is government work. We were very, um, we came in from Goldman, Bain, we, we are the, they, call, they used to call us the Oibo boys because, <laughs> you know, we didn't get the winks and we didn't know how to deal with the winks, right? But, so, a lot of deals, we did not do a lot of deals and our size was restricted, our growth was restricted from that perspective, but we chose our lane. We were thinking more long-term, what are we good at? Um, however, we found our, way, our own way to compete. Uh, and, I, and I'll give two examples, right? One was we acquired a, a registrar business. Uh, it's like custodian business here, so managing share registrars. Uh, so you deal with the company secretaries. And people told us that uh, you are Igbo speakers, they're gonna remove these registrars from you because you don't know how to give the handouts. But what we did was as soon as, a year after we did the acquisition, we arranged a retreat in Ghana. And we took all, so we found our own way, right? We brought trainers from UK, we flew all of them out, you know, they were there for the weekend. They got, you know, it was our way of, and we, we went there with the partners, we spent time with them. Same thing with, there was a regulator where, same issue, and what we did was, 
we actually, you know, arranged trainings for, and we gave it to them. We said, look, you select the people you want to send for training. Now, it, it wouldn't give us the number of jobs that our other peers that are doing other things are doing, but it actually helped stem the issues, but we did it in our own way, in a way that we could put on the books. Um, and so y you just need to decide how you want to play. Um, but um, government is, you have to come in touch with government. The question is, how do you choose to do it? I agree with my brother here. Look, in fact, when I was a younger entrepreneur, my, I used to think that run as far away from government as possible. That was uh, youthful foolishness. We cannot and we will never be able to out-entrepreneur our way out of bad governance. There's this idea we have that I think is very dangerous, which is we can just you know, leapfrog our way out of the bad governance in which we face. I, I think that's absolute nonsense. I think that there is only so far that we can achieve in terms of private markets. At the end of the day, no, no one has the scale, the reach, and the ability to create positive impact on the continent as government does. And so it's, it's actually very important for us to be able to engage government and to figure out how can we make government work. If we, if we all sit in the room here and all we do is bash government and complain, the bad decisions made outside, they'll come and affect us. All the good business decisions you make are meaningless if the CD slides 20%. Depreciation is going to affect you. And so, we, at the end of the day, you will pay the price. You will pay the consequences of that bad governance. Right? When there's a mishap, and God forbid, I always say, there was a, I saw this meme on Twitter where the, the health minister said, we are ready for coronavirus, and someone tweeted and said, Corona, he's joking, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but you laugh, but it's like, if you think government and government policy doesn't matter, let corona hit. All your board meetings and your HBS degrees and all of that becomes meaningless because suddenly your life and the life of your family is in danger. And so, again, if I think at a big picture level and if I think about how are we actually going to engineer the sort of social economic transformation that the continent needs, to leave a truly better world for our children and grandchildren. It's going to obviously require entrepreneurship, but it's also going to require some of the people in this room to roll up their hands, get into government, and to be public entrepreneurs. Because nowhere else in the world has built otherwise. It's not going to happen if we sit here all the time and complain. Someone has to go in, roll up their sleeves, and say, we're going, to, we're going to sacrifice. We're going to do what they take. I mean, think, I always say this. Think about the independence movement. Our forefathers and our foremothers literally were willing to give up their lives, their lives, and some of them died in the struggle just to ensure that we could be free, that today we are not holding British and French passports, though some people probably wish we were. <laughs> right? <laughs> Right, but, but they gave up their lives for us to be free. And I always ask myself, you know, in Ghana, our flag is red, gold, green. The red stands for the blood of our forefathers that were shed in the struggle. And I always ask myself, if we had to design a flag today, will there be a red? Can we truly say we have gone in and said we are ready to give it all? We are ready to give up our lives to build a different Africa for the future. China is doing it. And if we're not doing it, then can we really complain? Yeah, and, I, and you know, I think, and then this will be the last question before we open it up for a broader Q and A. But you know, you know, me, you know, on the back of this, on the back of your previous comments, you know, what are you most excited about about the markets that you know you guys are seeing right now, and what's what's making you most nervous? Okay, in terms of what's getting me uh, most excited, it's um, I see some progress with the youth increasingly driving entrepreneurship and commerce with the recent liberalization of capital sources. So I think Silicon Valley is providing capital. There are more local managers that have capital. When people like myself went back, you relied on a few big men to go talk to, to believe in you. Uh, maybe government, 
at some time you know, before, people used to be, it used to be contract. Now I'm seeing 20 something year olds, 30 something year olds doing businesses. I, as a PE manager, I'm excited about the first business that we funded is a 35 year old entrepreneur. We're talking to a 26 year old. I love the fact that I'm engaging with them. And just back to what you said, um, I actually, you know, part of why I wrote this book was to, you know, energize more people to say, look, take that leap. We need more of us because part of what has kept me there is people like me that wanted to bring what they were used to abroad back home, set new cyber cafes up, um, coffee shops, you know, things that, I, that, that have kept me there. It's because people come back uh, and we need to do that in government as well. And if we can liberalize the source of funding for pol you know, politics, I think what is happening in entrepreneurship could happen in government as well. That would lead me to what scares me the most, Gov you know, where government is. I think we could have been so much ahead. In my time back home, I was, I was having a chat with you that what makes me sad is we're doing good, but I know many people who started firms when we started that are gone. Why should that be? Why are they not? 20, 30, 40 groups like ours, but that's not the case. Um, part of it is what he's talking about. And we're having exodus to Canada right now and to other parts of the world. It's making the whole human capital issue even worse. That's what's scaring me. So I think, you know, at this point, we'll just open it up for questions just to make sure we can incorporate that. You know, I feel, you know, uh, pressure to, to say that let's make it questions, not speeches, uh, questions. Uh, <laughs> But just so you can hear from multiple people. So we have two mics. Um, so if you have a question, just raise your hand, and one of us will walk to you. OK, so I noticed her first. So. Oh. Hi, my name is Amevi, uh, originally from Togo. So my question goes mainly to Yomi, but Sangu, if you want, you can also jump, jump in. I really like the video that was shown at the beginning. And I think there was a time in the video that was said that the early years of the company was going through a lot of hard time. So can you please elaborate on some of the experiences that you went through, which maybe could have made your success story into a different type of story today? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, so first, I always, I, I'm going to keep this brief. Out. I always tell people that um, if we had started Cardinal Stone six months before, we would have died. Um, if we had tried to start it six months later, we would never have started it because we would have been too scared to start it. So it was good that we were ignorant when we started it. Um, we, 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 were seeing, we, we were seeing a market going up. And I think one of the things about entrepreneurs, particularly when you're, uh, you, know, you, you think you're seeing this trend, and if you could pull back 20 years, you would see that those trends, this happens. But you don't, when you're living it, you think that's what you're living, and that's what happened to us. So we started, and we had raised, we had commitments for 24, uh, but we, you know, we had only taken in a little bit we had mandates, so we, we rented office space. So we raised, eventually, $4 million came in. And we raised, we had put about half a million dollars into long lease and renovating the office. We had put about $2 million into the stock market because it was going up, right? That's all we saw. Um, and then we, we did a deal, and, um, and everything came crashing down. And we were renovating this office because, you know, we had a very detailed plan that in one year we were going to have 40 staff, right? And... We were renovating, spending the money, and the market was tanking. And uh, we're now going back to investors. Okay, give us the money. And they were like, no, that, that's okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, we had invested thinking the money was coming. <laughs> and uh, the stock market was going down. And long, in, six, in six months, it was clear we, were, we only had two months left on cash. And this was, we were supposed to be the next big thing. So the business plan was scrapped. Um, our first principal investment uh, deal, which I led, ended up being a fraud. Um, it was mistakes. Then that's when we learned to become entrepreneurs. We, we, started, we started doing, because there was no market. Like For like 18 months, the Nigerian market went quiet. So we started working for free so people would just know and respect us. We started training. We started, um, we became real estate agents because we had built, we had renovated <laughs> this grade A building and we only had eight staff. <laughs> so we, we went to in, invite international companies to take space. <laughs> we became entrepreneurs. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly, Yomi, Yomi touched on something that I, I think is quite critical. 
which is a lot of times we talk about success, but we don't talk about failure. And one of the things that um, I experienced personally, and I saw it, for the book I interviewed 600 entrepreneurs across 47 African countries. And one thing that gets very rarely spoken about, but is a very real thing for entrepreneurs, is mental health. Right? And it's something that is, we don't talk about it, there's the stigma around it, um, especially in our part of the world where, you know, if, if you have bronchitis, they'll take you to the hospital. If you're having mental illness, someone in your mother's village is doing something. <laughs> right? we, we have this stigma around, but it's really important. And I just want to emphasize it to make sure that the entrepreneurial journey can be lonely, it can be hard, it can be difficult. It's really, really, really important to take care of yourself. It's really important because nothing, nothing, nothing is worth Nothing is worth you not taking care of yourself. So it's really important. Check in on your loved ones, check in on your friends who are entrepreneurs, because there's a lot of performance when you're an entrepreneur, and there's a lot of darkness sometimes that comes to the territory. Hi, my name is Sudumi Sosabanda. Um, I run uh, SEO Africa, which is in the talent development space. So my question is to both of you, actually, um, and you both touched on this human capital development on the African continent. But in both of your um, comments, uh, you know, Yomi, we're talking about what you're doing at, Card at Cardinal Stone and what would be great for other companies to do. Um, Sangu, you talked about what's happening at Ashesi, what's happening at ALU, but those to me seem very small scale. If you look at like the University of Ghana, University of Lagos, they're graduating like thousands of students every year. So what are your thoughts on what can be done um, across the African continent on a much larger scale, and this might be at the government level, to actually start to change how we think about human capital development on the continent as being this bottleneck and how we can start to change how we train young people to be, um, to have these skills that employers need when they get into the workplace? Um, so a, a couple of comments there. The first I'll say is, you know, so while ALU is small scale now, its ambition is eventually to end up training about three million um, young people, right, every year, which I think is, is quite an ambitious target and, and a great one. They're, you know, they're looking to roll out about 25 of, of, of these campuses and then also they're doing, um, the ALX, you know, so they're, they're looking at hybrid models. How do you take, how do you rethink how we even look at learning, right? And, and how do you take advantage of, of e-learning platforms? Um, I think that technology is going to have to play a huge role here, right? We, we, we literally, I mean, first of all, um, so in, in Ghana, for example, the government came out with a policy where they rolled out, uh, uh, you know, free SHS, so free high school. And the immediate problem that happened was, so they rolled it out, there was not enough infrastructure. There, there, there literally is not enough physical space to hold the number of students that need to be taught. And so they were now forced to do a two-track system where you, know, you come for three months, someone else stays home, then you come and they called it like gold, green. It, it, it was, the, the, then there, there were literally not enough physical teachers. right? And so you have these constraints um, in terms of, so, so it's not just as simple as, okay, let's, let's just come out and roll out these schools. So we're going to have to actually rethink it and say, the benefits we have today, I think that we did not have 20 years ago, is the democratization of technology. Almost everyone has a cell phone. And so how can we rethink some of these platforms? How can we think of ways in which we can use digital tools and education to be able to expand the access? Um, we're going to have to, I, I don't think, you know, if, if you look at even the demands that's needed, I don't think within industry, I don't think we have to do every single person has to go to university. We need to actually build more vocational schools. Anyone who's done any real estate project, I, I'm doing some construction. Lord have mercy. Straight line. It's like this. It's like there's no standardized, it's like there's no like standardized mason school or contractor school. So one person will build it like this, the other person builds it like this, right? And, and it, it, everyone I talk to in the real estate industry is very frustrated about that. But there's a clear opportunity where we can actually have these vocational schools or anyone who's dealt with uh, plumbing. <laughs> let's, 
I, I brought a plumber one time for a leak in one toilet, but I thought he was done. <laughs> My house was raining. <laughs> right? And so I think that's a huge opportunity. So if we can start mapping out the, the actual demands in all these places and creating these sorts of vocational schools and other institutions that can help address that, we'll go a long way. But it's, that agency has to be there. Like, I, I, I just don't understand why our leaders don't, don't feel the agency, right? And I mean, we're, we're at one point, we're, we're going to be 2.5 billion people. And if, if we don't have the infrastructure at 1.2, I shudder to think of, you know, are we gonna have eight track systems when we get to 2.5 billion? And so we, we need to figure out ways that we can scale these solutions. Yeah, what he, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Enima, I'm also from Ghana. Actually, just to piggyback on that question and your answer, I wanted to just get a sense, what are some of the specific skills that you think are missing? Because yes, there are lots of students that are coming out of our universities that are graduating in Ghana, West Africa, South Africa, all over. What are some of the specific skills? You've just mentioned right now plumbing, masonry which is very true. Are there <laughs> other skills that you think are missing, just even from your businesses? What are some of the things? Because people are studying for years. What is it that they're yeah. not studying? Or what is it that we're not, what skills are we missing? <laughs> Can you just talk to that a bit, maybe? Okay, I'm just gonna, and then I'll pass it over. Uh -huh. English. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're laughing. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> you're laughing. Um, I'm, it's the basic stuff. Like, Let's go basic. I, I think I just wanted to add in, and the reason why I, I say tech, it's interesting, we have a complex problem, and it's gonna take time, um, but the curriculum, first of all, things need to be updated. Things have moved on in the world, but you need to see who's teaching. You know, people think about the schools, but who are the teachers, mm -hmm. right? You need to go to the cl classes and see what they're being taught. Uh, in, some, in some classes, the teachers are not really teaching. They're just there to mark time. And they have students that just finished NYSC that are going to teach, and these students don't really know much. So there's a very complex problem, and that's why it's got to be collective. Government, NGO, private sector. Private sector is interested, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, it's got to be a... Co and we're looking at school investments, but they've got to incentivize it. Even when you're thinking about investing in schools, you have to think about you know, everything, every business we think about, we're thinking about how do we build the infrastructure to support the growth. So you have to teach, think about the teaching, teaching the teachers and developing the teachers that will go into your schools. And um, so it's, it's a complex problem, but you know, at least in Nigeria, English, maths, the basic stuff, science, um, those skills are missing. And then the vocation, like everything. You know, we, many of our um, vocational workers now, we prefer them to come from Ghana. Um, so I don't know. We actually think it's you guys have No, it's that Jolos. <laughs> it's that Jolos. This guy. But, <laughs> so, <Okay>. so, <laughs> it, it, it's, the, uh, it's the video on. <laughs> it's the Jolos. <laughs> so, so two quick things there. The first is I'll say we, we need pedagogical innovations. And it, it boils down to a lot of critical thinking. And, and some of it, you know, I, I actually, I was very curious about this because I realized that there's this root memorization that you have. Or, or sometimes you send someone, um, um, I need cook. They'll go all the way to the cook place. There's no cook. All the way back, there's no cook. Okay, was there Pepsi? Yes. <laughs> go all the way, right? Everyone knows what I'm talking about here, right? And so, but, but it's easy to laugh about it, but I, I wanted to understand what's the source of that. And the more I did research, it turned out that, I mean, a lot of our educational system are vestiges from the colonial period. Now, the colonial period, the educational system was not designed for you to think. It was not, because they don't want rebels. So it was designed that, go and do ABC. Don't go and do the ABC, just like that. And, and you can see that filter into our educational system. Rote memorization, chew and pour. When I was in, uh, in Ghana, I took, for BEC, I took GA. I'm, I'm telling you, I set the record in my school. I had 100% in Ga. I don't speak a word of Ga. <laughs> I just memorized the book, and I had a very good memory. I memorized the book, and I poured it. But if you try to engage with me in Ga, I'll disgrace myself. 
and, and so that, we really need to change the way we approach pedagogy. But the flip side of that is um, one of, we're one of the earliest investors in Andela. And through Andela, I have seen the extraordinary ingenuity and creativity of our young people. People that, you know, you, you, you bring them, you train them in these computer skills, now they become engineers and they are doing projects for Microsoft, they're doing projects for other global companies, and they are thriving and excelling. And, and, and so a lot of it is really giving people the right sorts of opportunities and giving them a chance. Because that, you, know, you ask the question about what, am I, what are we most hopeful for? I mean, the thing that gives me the most hope at the end of the day, in spite of all our problems, is the creativity and the ingenuity of our people. I, when you watch, um, what's that uh, Marvel, um, Black Panther, the vibranium. I believe the vibranium is our human capital. That's our vibranium. And, and that's, that's going to be our future. Just real quick, I just want to, I, I want to jump on that real quick. I, for everybody here that's thinking of coming back or getting involved in Africa, I just want you, you know, if you're coming as an entrepreneur, manager, or anything, a big part of what you're coming to do is help elevate people's ways of thinking. Like, that's what he's doing in his company. That's what I'm doing. That's what Andela has done differently. And when I say thinking, I'm not talking about technical thinking. Um, it's about, you know, a big part of what we do is just, you know, when you're late for a meeting, just call the person, tell the person you're gonna be 10 minutes late. Just the little, no, no, you're, you're laughing. Like, I say it, like you're, it starts from your driver, your cook, your, everyone that works around you. A big part of your role when you come back is to help change their mindset, how they approach relationships. And that is a big part of what elevates this. Um, that's, that's what is going to elevate all of us in Africa, just that engagement. It's the teaching. So beyond the math, the English, it's how do you think? How do you solve a problem when they send you to buy Coke? How do you think about that? So it's just I'm thinking about that across your engagement. OK, this is the last question here. I hope it's good. <laughs> um, well, first and foremost, I want to thank all of you for spending your evening engaging with us. Um, it means a lot to me, and I'm sure it means a lot to all of us. My name is Kimberly Indibizu, and my family is from Nigeria. OK, so here's my question. It's quite general. Answer it with a small anecdote or, you know, however you'd like. So when building and operating a business in Africa, you know, how do you protect yourself from the risk of fraud and crime? Wow. <laughs> I'll let my senior brother start to answer. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's interesting. I mean, that's, that question, even when you're operating here too, there's fraud and there's crime. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in, that, that's a complex question. But it's, first of all, like he said, you need to understand how things are done on the ground. Um, when you, a, a number of things, right? Whenever you, from incubating a business to execution and all through, um, what, what is the ecosystem in which you're operating? Right? How, how do things operate? And that's the first decision making that you have. There are some sectors that, by virtue of the ecosystem within there, there are some things that you need to deal with. I'll give you an example. Oil and gas sector, when you go into um, exploration, uh, and, and stuff like that. There's a lot of government engagement, and to some degree, um, the things that you deal with there, you need to decide if that's the field within which you want to play. And then ask yourself, who are the collaborators that you need to work with? You need to tier the collaborators in doing your research to understand what's the reputation of the different collaborators, what's um, their history, the parties they've worked with, so it's your due diligence, the partners that you engage with, and those are the things that determine one, if you start off on the wrong foot, right? And again, your, your judgment and your sixth sense, right? When you're going through things, it's interesting. When we started at Cardinal Stone and things started going a little bit off, I mean, if, if you read the book, you find that it took some time for four of us. I mean, we all could see things going bad, but it's like we said, look, if nobody's talking, I, I must be wrong, right? And it took some time for someone to say, actually, guys, something is wrong. So part of what I would say is um, always listen to your sixth sense, bring things up, engage people, engage you know, good advisors, and as you would do in every other market. And so that's why I started by saying it's a tough question. 
I didn't go into Nigeria thinking, I mean, there's a lot of fear about it, but you know, not to get, in America here, a lot of things that happen there happen here. It's just that when you're a worker bee, you don't get to see it. You just don't get to see it. There, it's two degrees of separation, so you get to see it. So it's not really an African yeah. thing, it's business. I don't know. I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think there are a couple of things to unpack that I think are embedded in that question. So the first is, um, you know, when I worked in the, in the hedge fund world, I used, to be, I used to be a short seller. And the biggest frauds the world has ever seen all came from the US. I mean, these are facts. Whether it's Enron, whether it's um, uh, uh, Madoff, who is now asking for early release, or whether it's the last presidential election. <laughs> right. Um, but the second thing I also want to unpack, which I think is very important, is Africa is not a monolithic thing. And so I've spent time now in 47 African countries, and your approach in the different countries will be very different. Um, you know, the, the, the way things are done in Francophone Africa, very different. In fact, the, the, biggest, the, the biggest sign for me when I realized that, no, 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 Africa is not a country. When I, the first time I went to East Africa and they brought me food, I said, this is African food, no spice. We are not the same people. <laughs> I was like, we're just not the same people. <laughs> But, but, so, but in all seriousness, there's a way in which I think sometimes we oversimplify the continent and we flatten the diversity of the continent. And that in and of itself, we need, we need to be quite conscious of that. We need to approach the continent with humility because of its vastness. You can literally fit North America, Europe, China, India in the continent and still have space. And so you know, the different markets are very different, but at the end of the day, the way you protect yourself, I always say, is there's no, no contract, no NDA, no whatever it is will ever protect you from bad people. And so you need to really focus your time thinking about who are you doing business with? What relationships are you building? And so for me, the way I've navigated that is anytime I'm building a business relationship, I don't just want to know about the numbers and stuff. I actually want to know about the person. Like, and sometimes I'll ask strange questions, like, oh, when was the last time you called your mom? <laughs> like, I just want to understand the person because that to me becomes a better sense of, you know, a better indicator of protection versus any sort of legal document you could sign. Please give our speakers a round of applause. Thank you.